It's the How to Write Funny Podcast. I am Scott Dickers, and on this episode, I chat with comedy writer and author Mike Sachs. Mike, tell me what you've been up to lately. Uh, well, it's funny. Uh, you know, I started off writing uh, comedy for the page, and um, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to write books and, and articles, and potentially my dream was to write for Late Night with David Letterman. That was my big dream. And... Um, then later, when I saw that it was, as a kid in New Orleans and then Virginia and Maryland, not to be able to write for TV, I didn't know how to do it, so I just started writing for print. And one of my big influences was your The Onion, which I, I knew about in print. I heard about coming out of, of Wisconsin, this amazing product. Um, and that was, that was a you. huge influence on me. But so it was always my dream just to write comedy. But then I sort of got waylaid into writing interviews, uh, putting together interviews with comedy writers, which was never for money. It was always just an excuse to find out how they did it. You know, how do you go from point A to point B? How do you become a professional comedy writer? It was very mis mysterious to me. I didn't know anyone who wrote, let alone wrote comedy. I didn't know anyone who knew any writers. So was, I had the exact same problem. Yeah. So I'm excited to hear how you... Well, it was almost like it. looking, you know, I would remember working in, re I worked retail 10 years in New Orleans, Maryland, Virginia, in the record stores. Oh. And um, I just remember going next door to the bookstore, looking at magazines and the mastheads and the bylines and thinking, how does one get there? Yep. You know, it might as well have been, how does one become an astronaut? Yeah. Just, oh, really? I don't know how to do it. It's a mystery to me. How does one do it? And in retrospect, I would have done a lot of things differently, and I wouldn't have done certain things. But at that time, you know, when you're young, and you're and you're at the bottom, and you're making seven bucks an hour, uh, and you see adults working there for years and years who have no insurance, who are wearing chucka boots at the age of fifty, who eat standing up, um, you desperately want to make it, but you don't know how. So, well, this is a long-winded way of saying, okay. what are you doing? I was going to, let's get back to that, because I want to dig into that. Since maybe a lot of people don't know you, let's, let's find out what you're doing right now. Okay, so right now I am working at Vanity Fair on the editorial staff where I've been working. I freelance for a couple of magazines, and right now my main focus is writing these short little comedy books that are being made into uh, audiobooks. And the last, the that, first of which I saw and thought was great. Thank you. Yeah, Stinker Let's Loose. It was number thirteen of New York Times audiobooks, which is Fantastic. astonishing. But it's star studded, right? And well, I want to talk to you about that. Yeah, but that yeah. So it's and tell us about the book. It's a parody. Yeah, it's a novelization. I, I'm a big fan of novelizations, and I thought it'd be fun to write a novelization based on a 1970s movie, specifically a CB and Trucking movie which I have not seen anyone really take on, probably for a good reason. But I was very much into these movies, whether it was Hooper, whether it was uh, Smoking the Bandit, um, all this stuff. A I lot of great CB trucker movies in the late 70s. Great stuff. And you look at it. BJ and the Bear. A great, there was a whole TV series. A whole TV series. I mean, you know, Dukes it of was Hazzard. Big. It was big. People don't realize who went there. Well, that's just the thing. I mean, it's been forgotten. The CB radio was really a craze. It was the pre-internet craze. It was craze. Huge. huge. We all I, learned the codes I have a dictionary. What's your up twenty? There. Yeah, you have the dictionary, of course. Yeah, my aunt was Honey Honey Badger or Beaver. I, don't, I forget what her code name was. I mean, she was just a Jewish woman from Pittsburgh who she was on the CB. So everyone, I, you know, I knew people who were on. It was a magical world for me. So I just wanted to sort of satirize that. And you look at the movies now, and they're way dated. Oh yeah, it's almost looking at something that's sci-fi. You know, like something taking place on another planet. And you're tapping every which way but loose as well. Monkey movies from the 70s. Right, yeah. I, for some reason, orangutans were huge in the 70s, especially those who were trained to blow raspberries and stick up their finger. Sure. Um, but I wanted to do one who was just, you know, in estrus, crazy, and would rip off faces, you know, yeah. not as well trained as those <laughs> right, in the movies. Right. So I put out that book, not really thinking much about it, and um, someone got in touch with me, Eric Martin, who is a narrator and a producer, and he said, can I have the rights to this? I want to do it as an audio book. And I said, sure, not thinking anything. And he just discovered the book at random. He discovered the book because he was on my email list. Okay. He has, he's, he's been in the scene. He had a uh, podcast called This American Wife. Uh, and he's a great guy. And I, I said, I always say yes. I said, sure. And typically not much happens. But 
I think it's a good lesson in a sense that you say yes enough, something good will happen. Because you never know where opportunity is going to strike. You never know. Or where know. something's going to blow up. Absolutely. And it's not, I didn't need money. I needed money, but I didn't ask for money. And if I had, I would have said no. But I'm glad I didn't because in the end, sometimes just getting it out there is the advantage rather Absolutely. than having something up front. And he managed, God knows how, to get this cast together, including John Hamm, uh, Ray Seahorn, Philip Baker Hall from Boogie Nights. Mm -hmm. Amazing. I mean, Paul F. Tompkins, a Andy Richter, John DiMaggio. Amazing. Yeah, totally amazing. Just astonishing. And I, 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 to this day, I don't know why they said yes. It was not like they were paid that much money. I think it was just one of those things that they grew up with as well. Um, but it, it was a good lesson. I was sort of stunned, but it was the type of lesson I learned talking to all those comedy writers over the years is you just have to keep producing and getting stuff out there. And talking to which money. comedy writers over the years? Well, I've written two books, and here's The Kicker and Poking a Dead Frog. Yeah, tell us about those. Those were a big... These are books that were just an excuse to talk to my favorite writers, whether they were... 96 year old Peg Lynch who created one of the first sitcoms great interview with her oh thanks amazing, amazing. woman let me just talk yeah. a little bit about she just passed away two years sure. ago she's an amazing I, I reached out to a an expert in radio comedy and I said are there any writers for radio comedy still alive and he said I don't know there he, here are 10 names they might be they may they may not be I'm not sure but you know search it out so I, I looked I went down the list and none were alive except for Peg and Peg, I just happened to find in a, in a small town in Massachusetts, I called the um, local council and they said, oh, Peg Lynch, yeah, we know Peg. And I thought she might be in an old age home, but no, she answered the phone. They gave me her number she, and I called, ended up talking with her for over two hours that first time. Just an amazing woman who I think was somewhat forgotten or she felt she was forgotten. She, as a kid, she was 14 years old. She started her own radio show in Minnesota and her mom was a nurse at the um, Mayo Clinic. So she would interview celebrities passing through the Mayo Clinic. And the first interview she did at 14 years old was Lou Gehrig, who was being diagnosed that week with ALS. And even knowing he had ALS, he said yes to an interview. So this is his last interview. And this was her first interview. And she later interviewed Newt Rockney. Just an amazing group of people. Uh, then became a writer and wrote over 20,000 comedy scripts uh, for the first uh, sitcom um, on radio, the first sitcom that was lifelike. They compare it now to the Seinfeld of, of that day. Uh, so just an amazing writer, uh, and a great person. It was just total luck that I stumbled across her. But that was one of the things where if I didn't, even want to write a book and I knew it was going to be a lot of work on top of everything else I never would have met her or anyone else so and so you were doing the Judd Apatow method because that's what he did he yeah well he did it very young he, he was like 14 young, or 15 high school. right and then it, you meet this woman who it sounds like she kind of did the same thing interviewed famous people right and and I think I recommend that to young writers if you like someone's writing reach out it's rare. Like when you get to be at a certain level, it is rare that people approach you and say, hey, I'd like to just talk to you and get your advice. I'm a young writer. So people would be surprised just how receptive people are to that because it is pretty rare. Is it rare? I find that I think what's rare is can I can I ask you about your life and how I might affect my career through your career yeah but what, what i do hear about. oftentimes is oh can you pass this along to such oh and yeah such it's editor? always like can you do something for me exactly. can i get a shortcut right. can yeah. you pass my writing on and nobody wants to get that email but i think everybody wants to get the email hey i'm a struggling young comedian i'd love to talk to you about how you achieved your success or whatever that is rare right what did you do and and more importantly what did you what would you recommend i not do yeah and i think a great way of doing that is to interview someone, whether it's for your podcast or for your website or whatever. And School I think paper, anything, you know, whatever. And in fact, sometimes that's even uh, advantageous over a magazine. If someone calls or emails from a high school newspaper, it's pretty hard to say no. I will never say no to that. And people do it all the time. Maybe every year, twice a year, something like that. I'll get a call like that. And I bet you there's a lot of other people who think of doing it, but don't because they think they're going to get a no. Right. And I think it's important to know that 
what I was talking about before, how to make that connection, how to go from point A to point B is not as hard and mysterious as you might think it is. And there are many routes, and that's but one of them. There are many routes, and everyone started off at the beginning of that route. And if they are a decent person, which most good comedy writers are, they will get back to you. Mm -hmm. And I think they um, will admire the fact that you reached out and want to, you know, find out what is going to work uh, from your own end. And I think it saves a lot of time. I mean, if you ask someone, what did you do to get where you are and what did you what would you recommend I not do? You can save years like it would have saved me years if I had if I had had the nerve to do it when I was first starting off and I did not have that nerve. It was yeah. also more difficult. This is pre-internet. Yeah, it is easier to reach people now. That's certain. Though, I had a friend who would call people, and his credo was, almost anybody in the world is three phone calls away. So you call, you know, the show that they're on, and then you maybe get a manager or an agent or a publicist, and then maybe you get them. And he did a lot of that when he was in high school, and he scored a lot of good interviews that That's way. That's amazing. I, I really admire that. I did not have the nerve to do that. Nor did I. I. I would be so frightened. I remember I had to make one call, business call. It wasn't even to a famous person, but I, I had to walk around the block for a half hour to burn off steam. Wow. It's very, very shy. And I, I admire that, and it's something I would recommend, but it's not as easy as it would appear, I suppose. So you did the books, and there were two, right? Dissecting the Frog. First one was And Here's the Kicker, and the second was Poking a Dead Poking Frog. Poking a Dead Frog and Here's the Kicker are the two. So you did those when you were already a magazine writer. You had already achieved a certain amount of success in the business. Right. But I did see that a lot of these old comedy writers were dying off. That generation um, was... It was almost like the old jazz musicians or old athletes... Like those commie writers who knew the Marx Brothers weren't going to be around forever. And those commie writers who wrote for, uh, for instance, I interviewed Irv Brecker who wrote for the Marx Brothers and punched up the script to The Wizard of Oz, if you can imagine. He wrote the jokes uh, mostly concerning the uh, Cowardly Lion. Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, well, there was some, yeah, there was some yeah, put him up, in put there, up. some jokes. Yeah, yeah. Um, great guy who was in his 90s. So just to be able to, to ask him what was it like to write jokes for Groucho Marx, it was an amazing thing. I mean, it was like a bridge to another time. And I am glad I did it at that time because a lot of them passed away shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. uh, Larry Gelbart, who wrote for Bob Hope when he was first starting off at 16 or 17 writing gags following Bob Hope <laughs> around the world. And uh, dealing with that craziness. Um, and then, of course, he he uh, wrote for your show of shows and then the MASH TV sitcom, um, as well as the script for Tootsie, all that stuff. So it was just great to, to be able to talk to someone like that. And what I found out, too, was that the difficult people to get a hold of, and this remained true for both books, were the younger writers. The older writers such as Larry Gelbart, or Brecker, Peg Lynch. Larry Gelbart got back to me in five minutes on his wow. AOL.com email. <laughs> wow. Huge font. Yes, I will do this. Um, whereas a lot of writers either said no or just never got back to me, which is worse than no. Yeah. And a lot of them, the younger ones, had a million people between themselves and you. The older ones who wrote and grew up on the streets, basically, were out there and reachable. And it surprised so me. Yeah. Yeah. So after you wrote those books, how did that lead to you getting more into comedy? I was always into it, but I, you know, my day job was working at Vanity Fair, which wasn't comedy related. And I didn't necessarily want to write for TV. I didn't want to go out to Hollywood. I didn't want to write for a late night show. So you were done with the David Letterman goal at this point. You know, I think if, if David Letterman or his producer had called me, I would have been there in a second. But I, I later became friendly with some writers and from what I heard not a fun show to work at I heard the same just the opposite in fact Letterman admitted to that he says it'll look good on your resume but this is not a fun place to work <laughs> right so when the boss says that you know you got trouble but yeah I, I wanted to get more into um, writing comedy and I put out a book called your wildest dreams within reason which was a collection of pieces but with this last book that I wrote it was such a sense of freedom it was 
I just thought I'm going to do it for myself. I'll put it out. I'll publish it myself. I'll have it designed by myself. My girlfriend is a publisher at Random House. And I'll just do it. And now, let it me just back felt, you up. Yeah. I don't know that other book you mentioned, the book of essays. Where and how did you publish that? Was that oh, a that publisher? Was th- yeah, that was through Tin House in, in Portland, Oregon. Okay. I sent them um, Shouts and Murmurs pieces from New Yorker, Esquire pieces, Vanity Fair pieces, McSweeney's pieces. And I said, would you be interested in putting this out like a Woody Allen um, side effects, you know, any of his right. books. And they, of and they said, yes, and they did. Um, so that came out a few years ago and it, you know, came out and then it went and there was no huge interest in it. And I don't think, you know, some reviews, some good, some not good, but I thought I wanted to do another book, but do it a different way. And I thought that a fake novelization would be a good way to go about that. And it was just a freedom that I felt doing that, which I haven't felt in a long time. I mean, you've dealt with magazines and newspapers. You know what it's like to deal with editors, and especially when it comes to comedy. You know, they, they all have their own suggestions, and they'll love it, but the top editor won't get it, and it'll be tweaked, and then it'll be tweaked to something that you don't want, but your name's still on it. Right. So th- it's very frustrating. But I think now there's an opportunity to, to do what you want, how you want to do it, that didn't exist in the past. Yeah, so tell us how you navigated that self-publishing landscape and how you decided to publish it the way you did, because anyone can do it right now. Anyone can put out a book tomorrow, today, if they want. So how did you, did you research that to figure out the way that you thought would work best? Or did you, did you already know from having talked to people? Like, what was your process there? Well, you know, I had frustrations with, with the book publishing world because... All of the ideas that I've had in the past have never been accepted by agents. I've always had to pretty much sell these books on my own. So then once I, once I dealt with, once it got accepted uh, by a publisher, it was two years until publication. And then there was a lot of fighting over the design, the look of it, the tone of it. Now, are you talking about other books besides your book of essays? No, both those books of essays were. Okay. And um, then obviously you dealt with the books of the interview books as well. Oh with, no! With I'm publishers. sorry. the 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 inter, The book of essays was extremely easy. That was through Tin House. Okay. They let me do whatever I want. The book of interviews, especially the first one, was difficult. They didn't want certain people in there. They it, they felt certain interviews were too long. Hmm. They wanted me to hit certain points. Um, throughout it, that I didn't want to hit uh, as as an interviewer. I see. So it was a little frustrating. And when it came to publishing comedy books after my book of essays. It, the industry had really changed. So it, it really had to be a specific type of book, whether it was like Trump's tweets or whether it was dogs versus cats, whether it was uh, the funny aspects of being a new parent. You know, it has to have a hook. And even then, it'll be changed. And even then, it'll be three years before it comes out. Did you write books like that? Those little one-offs where you don't no, even get author credit? Okay. I didn't. I had friends who did. And it, you know, it was for money only. And yeah, it, no, they take a a little advance and it's like a point of purchase book that they put together quickly. Yeah. I've heard of those things. Yeah. And my friends were never really happy with the final product. And also it went bad quickly. They weren't evergreen ideas. So, um, these books that you right now are coming out in three years. Will people want to read Trump tweets in three years? I don't want to read them now, let alone three years. Mm -hmm. And they're not easy to write. You know, they're they're, they It takes a lot of work. So I was a little, I was kind of frustrated because I, I, I love books and I wanted to write, continue to write books. But I thought, why can't I do it myself? Um, when I was growing up outside D.C. in Virginia and Maryland, Ian Micaiah Fugazi did it all on his own. Are you familiar with uh, Discord Records? This is a guy who, his father worked as a reporter for the Washington Post. He grew up in Glover Park section of D.C., knew no one. And just through force of will, put out these records that Minor Threat, Fugazi, um, Rights of Spring later for other Fugazi members, that just became these huge underground hits and influ- influenced a ton, a generation of musicians, uh, including those who got into grunge later. But he, this is a guy who did it his way, charged $5 a record, all age shows, and still owns the rights to these records. So I was thinking about this guy, it's like, why can't I do the same thing now, you know, with self-publishing, which is as easy as it's ever been. I don't need to wait two years. I don't need to get acceptance. 
the agent that I was working with is not interested in this novelization idea anyway. So it just occurred to me, like you said, I can put this out today um, if I wanted to. Of course, I had to write it first, but I wrote it in about six months and then just thought, I'll put it out. Because in the end, you market your own books anyway. You know, yeah, they, anyone you publish with is going to want you to have a following. They're going to want you to go out and pitch it you know, at, at book signings or wherever. They, they don't do much. But it's up to you. It's really yeah. up to you in the end. Um, you know, and, and what you say is completely true. That's more important to them sometimes than the book itself. Well, it's why celebrities are the authors now, because they know a celebrity's book will sell because people know them. They have a platform. They go on TV. They talk about the book. The you first thing the they book. ask, how many, how many Instagram followers Absolutely. do you have? Absolutely. If you have 150,000 Instagram followers and you're not that good of a writer, but versus someone who's a great writer with 100 Instagram followers. Yeah, guess who's going to get the book. Right. <laughs> it's all about marketing anyway. Yeah. But so tell us the in the weeds, like how did you figure out where to publish the book and how? Because there are ways you can do it. Like I do mine on Amazon, pretty simple, but I, you went a different route. You I went did. Ingram. I went Ingram, uh, which is I just reached out to them. I said, how does one do this? I had no idea. How does one do this? And they said, this is what you do. You will send us the Word document when you're done. You will send us the design when it's done. We will work with the designer. Uh, we will send you a copy of what it will look like in hard copy, which it does not happen in regular publishing. You only see it in galley proof. You don't right. see it. You don't hold it in your hand like you would in a store. And when you say hard copy, you don't mean a hard cover. You mean paperback. Right. But That's a, right. But a physical version of the book. Right, something tangible that you can hold in your hand, not a digital version, which right. was important to me. I didn't want a digital version only. I wanted something that you could hold in your hand. And I said, I want to make it look like a 1970s novelization. Would you be okay with that? And they worked with me. They said, yes, we can make it 8 eight by 10 or whatever the size was, actually smaller. Yeah, it's like 6 by 4 right. or something. We can make it look like it was torn up, like you're buying it used. Wow off of a boardwalk, you know, used bookstore. Um, we can do this, we can do that. We can put fake movie stills in the middle. Like all this was, I had no idea you could do this. They were willing to work with me, and they're willing to work with a lot of writers because, you know, it's a business for them. They get a cut of the book, but it's also advantageous for them for this book to sell really well. And what did they charge for all that? They get a cut from each book. So it's just the cut, nothing on top. That's right. The, and then do they push the book at all? They put it in an Ingram catalog or they get it online to all the online stores? Or? Yeah, they, they will push it. Um, I never saw it in a store, which is fine. But it, I knew it was up to me mostly anyway. But they will push it. They will talk to just say the, um, the, the purchaser, you know, uh, book buyers at um, Target or you know wherever they sell books. They not surprisingly didn't want this book, but they they're a real <laughs> business now. You know, it's, yeah, yeah. You know, self publishing isn't what it used to be, where you would buy your own book, a thousand copies, and it would sit in the basement for. Yeah, that's vanity publishing, which is different. Right. This is P POD, which is uh, published on a purchase, print on demand, print on demand. Yeah. Right. So it's it's not printed unless someone purchases it. Exactly. So uh, they're using some sort of digital printing method. They're not, you know. Like in the old days, you'd have to print 10,000 copies of the book just to make it worth your while to make the linotype or whatever. And they just don't, they don't need to do that anymore. They don't need because to do that. Technology. And that never worked. I mean, everyone knows people, well, not everyone, <laughs> but you know, with books or their own vanity project in the basement, you know. Exactly. So what is their cut at Ingram? Uh, their cut is, um, I think, I don't even know. Uh, it, it was being sold for $9. Um, they get at least one dollar a book. I get one dollar a book. Uh, they may get a little bit more. And then the rest is goes to the cost of printing. That's or? right. Yeah. And it, it's as you said, it's all digital. It's computer. It looks really good. But they're very much willing to work with you. And there was a real sense of freedom because you are in charge. I mean, for better or for worse, you're in charge of the of the copy. You're in charge of the design, and then you're in charge of the marketing. Well, it's such a rare thing because so much comedy now is corporate produced. Almost even though there's so many channels, there's something missing about that pure vision that somebody has for something unique that, like you said, no agent would represent it. No publisher would pick it up, but it's unique and it's fresh and it's original. And there's some of that stuff out there, but how do you find it? It's like out there on somebody's blog somewhere. Somebody maybe is doing some really original stuff, but... 
if you're plugged in and you're trying to find original comedy, you're going to get corporate stuff. You're going to get it on the internet or on TV or wherever. So it's exciting that you're doing that. The best comedy, as you know, is, is, is executive free, whether it's The Onion, whether it's Early Simpsons, whether it's Monty Python. The, the executives didn't know what was good. They thought it was a real circus they were filming Monty Python, <laughs> uh, according to Terry. Uh, Even, you know, the National Lampoon. National Just, Lampoon. Yeah, everything that starts as a, a vision of someone who's not seeing the type of comedy that they like out in the world. And they're like, well, I need to create this. And it's not done for money. It's just no, out there and love. they do it. And people tend to find it. Now, it, you can publish anything you want now, but as you said, it's a, it's a matter of rising above the stimuli. How do you do it? That's really the hard part, is, is how do you rise above it? And because it got purchased by Audible, it rose above it. And You weren't really, you hadn't risen? No. Your email list, you mentioned, that's something a lot of people may not have realized is important. But when you're in the business and you have an email list you kind of collect your fans in a bucket and it grows over time and it can be an incredibly valuable thing. So your audiobook guy came from there. How do you start that? How do you build that? Any tips for that? Yeah, I think I would recommend that highly. I would, any person you meet, any person you email, anyone who, who, whose work you like um, that you've been in touch with, save that email, add it to a list and whenever you don't overdo it, but when you have something new out, send out an email blast. Now, even if it's 1,000, 2,000 people, you know, it's not 100,000 or a million people. These are 1,000 people who are, you know, it's direct marketing. It's pinpoint marketing. And it's going to those whom you know would be interested in something like this. And because of that, because it's out there, nothing can really grow if it's stagnant. It has to be moving out there. And once it's out there, you never know what can happen, which is what happened with getting in touch with Eric Martin. That would not have happened if I didn't send out that email blast. I would just have this book, you know, one or two copies sitting here. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wouldn't have led to what's coming up, you know, because w- one move can, can really make a difference. It, it can really push you forward. And that one email blast opened up doors that wouldn't have existed otherwise. Yeah, so did you collect emails from fans too like through your book did you put it in the back um hey sign up for my email list or anything like that i didn't even say sign up if someone got in touch with me and said i really love poking a dead frog i always get back to people and thank them i mean it does it just i still can't believe that they would do that it's just incredibly nice and it means a lot um i'll just put them on a list and whether it's three months or four months or a year later when i have a new product out they will hear about it and they can sign out you know they can you know, opt out right immediately. But if if they do stay, they will get these updates. And it's really anyone whom I know to be in into comedy. Interesting. So your list is really selective because the the best practices, some of the more successful self published authors, always put what they call a reader magnet in the book, so that anybody who buys their book wants to go to the website and sign up to the email list and get something. So they collect fans that way. And it doesn't sound like you're doing that. No, and, the, and these people you're talking about, some of them have hundreds of thousands of followers. Yes. I do not. This is very specific. I, I maybe should do that. I don't. It's really if, you know, a connection. If, if I make a connection with someone, even sitting next to them in a bar talking about comedy, if they give me their email, I add them to the list. So it's really a grassroots type of thing. It's not a mass marketing type of thing. This is not bringing in hundreds of thousands of readers. This is a very specific... Um, comedy geek group right well that's why i wanted to talk to you primarily is because your books haven't blown up you haven't sold the movie rights to your fake 70s movie novelization which i hope you do you sold the audiobook rights but i feel like you're at the start of something really exciting that could be oh, big interesting okay, and thank you. i'm excited to see where it goes so that's what you're up to now that's what you're doing now is there anything we missed well no i mean that because of the first book um, I thought I want to take advantage of this and write another fake novelization. This one to take place in the eighties because I felt that the John Hughes was sort of in the air. And then since I started the book, Molly Ringwald has come out, talked about John Hughes movies. I've been watching them with my daughter. That's how I sort of, I've been thinking about them again and they're very dated also. Um, they're very much of their time and ripe to be made fun of. 
So I just wrote and um, and this is a 19, this is a movie that takes place in the 1980s in the John Hughes type world. Great, but um, I am desperately trying to sell Stinker. Um, uh, John Hamm just said he would be executive producer if if anything ever happens as a movie. Either as a movie or as a documentary series, like documentary now. Like the making of Stinker. Exactly. Or That'd be really interesting. Yeah. Or or or, or modern day of uh, uh, the daughter of the guy who played Stinker goes out and tries to find whatever happened to her father. Um, cool. But that's just all happens because, um, and it wasn't for money, and it was a lot of work. I mean, six months of nights and weekends, and uh, just getting it out there, making something you know, exist that didn't exist before. And that's really what I recommend for anyone. You have to keep moving forward. And it's usually something that you love the most that, that kicks in, that makes a connection. Yeah. And you mentioned John Hamm again. So he was in your audiobook, and he, he'll be the executive producer if something happens with another iteration of that project. But I also noticed on your book that your author photo is John Hamm. And I think right. you interviewed him for Vanity Fair, so it seems like maybe he's your buddy, and a lot of people might be saying, well, John Hamm's his buddy, of course, that's why he gets all <laughs> these opportunities. But let's be clear, the, re- the reason you know John Hamm is because you've hustled and worked and written and interviewed him. <laughs> I don't know him, really. I mean, okay. I, I never interviewed him. Um, oh, I thought you had. Okay. No. The, the, he liked the first book. And and a friend of mine... Uh, Here's the kicker you're talking about. Yeah, and so I thought... And I heard about that through someone, and I said... I asked a photographer friend, I said, I'd love for him to be on the cover of the second book, Poking a Dead Frog. And I said, would you ask him? And he just said... Yeah. And he's the type of guy who's just... He's a huge humor fan, and he's, he's the type of guy who says yes to things that interest him. Hmm. He's just a great guy. So he said yes to that cover. Now, of course working with a big big publisher here here's an example of that they didn't want him on the cover right can you imagine not right. wanting one of the best looking men in the world on the cover <laughs> right so a lot of great photos so I, I went you know head but you know I said to him listen um, publisher doesn't want it for the cover would you be okay if you were my f- um, author's photo and he very nicely said sure you can do that um, but yeah I mean that was just a case of someone liking what I wrote not for money you know it it was Mm -hmm. just something that interests you and and if you do it in a certain way will interest others and that world is very reachable now you know and I try to tell that to young students you don't it doesn't have to be a mysterious world you can reach out like you were saying with your friend everyone now it's not three phone calls it's three clicks away literally maybe even two clicks away and yeah people are afraid to do it because they're afraid of getting ignored or rejected but again, the secret is don't ask for something. Give something. Exactly. That's all it takes. Just say, listen, can I, I love you and your career. Can I interview you? I, I want to know more about you. I can expose you to nearly 30 right. listeners to my high school radio station. But why is it when, when high school students get in touch with you, is it almost more exciting, isn't it? It's a little more exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's something really exciting about somebody who's, still hungry and has passion and who has has barely started out that's you know you could have a big influence on them well think about how important it was when when you were a kid oh absolutely you know i would meet local celebrities whether they were you know washington redskins or whomever you and you were flying you couldn't believe that they were you were in yep. close proximity to them. <laughs> yep all right so let uh that's what you're up to now let's take take you back i want to know how you got into writing comedy you started writing these essays and submitting them to places like McSweeney's getting published in Shouts and Murmurs is a big deal like how did you crack those nuts um it was just well McSweeney's was one of those things where I I felt very isolated in the late 90s I mean this was after college um there were very few outlets very very few outlets this is before the the explosion of the web and when McSweeney's came, well, first of all, the onion to me was it, but uh, the onion was the toughest not to crack. Like you had to be there from what I heard and, you know, washing dishes for seven years, like Todd Hansen doing it for free. I mean, that's, it was like being in a band in Liverpool or something. You, I, I that would have been my dream writing for the onion, but 
that wasn't going to happen. So when I saw McSweeney's out there, it was really the first time where I thought, I can, this is my sensibility, and I can make this happen. And I started contributing, and Dave Eggers was the one who was accepting at that time. So he accepted a, a, a few of mine. Uh, this is 99. Um, Jesus, 20 years ago. But that was really the first time I thought, I can reach people by writing something that interests me. It's not... I had been writing for Mad Magazine and Cracked Magazine before that, and it was always, you know, very good money, but it wasn't what I wanted to be writing. And how did you get in there? Did you just blind submit to them? Blind submit. And I, I later asked them, I said, I'm shocked that you took a, you know, I was, I was in college, like, you would take a college kid, you know, to do that. He said, we like working with college kids. <laughs> you know, they're not stubborn. They're willing to work to where we want them. And they're raw. And if they show any promise, we love that. And that was a shock to me. Because I, I didn't think that it would be even be able to get... Mad Magazine was huge when I was a kid. So that was a, that was a shock that, that I could do that. And it took me years to find that out. And how do you know... And I should say, I felt the same way at The Onion. I always wanted to hire people who had no comedy experience whatsoever. They're raw. They're trainable. They don't have bad habits. So I think I see where Mad and Cracked are coming from with that. But I often advise people, like, send your stuff to Mad and Cracked. You know, why not? But a lot of people often get lost in the, in the weeds, and they'll, they'll say, well, how do you submit? What should your cover letter say? What, what should I submit? Maybe you can speak to that since you've done it and been successful. I don't think it's a big concern, but maybe you have thoughts about it. Well, I think a big mistake is to send them too much and to be funny in your pitch letter. I think what's important is these are busy guys and and women and <laughs> they're they're looking over this slush pile. They don't want to be um, dragged down. They just want to see if the person can write and has a good idea. And if you send in just a list of ideas, uh, sometimes that's enough. You don't have to send in a finished product. Either they'll, they'll like the idea or they won't like the idea. But just sometimes a simple, this is who I am, this is what I want to do, here's, here's a list of ideas. So they can get a sense of your comedic take on things. Exactly, your sensibility. And they're taking a chance on you no matter what you send in, but don't send in too much. Don't be cute. Don't send in gag gifts. I know some editors who receive gag gifts don't send we in... used to get confetti in letters. Yeah, who the hell needs it, right? It's madness. I mean, Susan Morrison, the New Yorker, who, who does the uh, Shouts and Murmurs, was telling me that people would would send her flowers and th like, who, who needs that crap, right? Yeah, the job is not to get their attention by any means necessary. The job is just show them that you can write funny. And I understand that desperation because I've been, I know what it's like to think about like what goes on in the mad office, what goes on in the New York, it must be magical. Well, it's like any other office where it's very busy. You have very talented people who are reading these submissions who may not want to, who have other things to be doing, short and sweet, and don't oversell yourself. You're a salesman. Don't oversell the product. This is who I am. Here, here it is. And either they'll like it or they won't like it. Now, if they don't like it, you can still keep submitting. Yep. Um, I, I wouldn't you know, walk away uh, saddened by this. Some people never submit again. Because they're crushed that they were rejected. Right. And they don't I mean, realize you, that's merely step one. The thing you have to realize is the best writers, in the, like David Sedaris, still is rejected with certain pieces. Mm-hmm. Mark Lehner, when he was writing for Esquire, rejected. Everyone is rejected. Nothing is magical. Jack Handy, when he writes Shouts and Murmurs, may have a 50 to 60% success rate. So if someone like that is going to be rejected, you're going to be rejected too. Especially starting out. Especially Expect starting out. Expect your first few to just not even land. That's right. But learn something from it. Yeah. If the editor even writes something to you, scribbles something on a note or sends you an email, that's a major win. Big progress, yep. So you keep that connection, and you keep going for that. Yeah, I learned that with comic strips, because I started in comic strips and submitting comics to the big syndicates. You would always get a form rejection letter back. And I got this great advice many years ago to cherish those rejection letters, because it meant that they got it, and, and they responded to you. And that was cause for celebration, and to keep sending, keep sending. And eventually, maybe you'll get a handwritten note etched on the form letter saying... You know, we all, you know, this one was pretty good or <laughs> whatever, less, you know, zip -a -tone. I don't know, whatever they might say on it. 
but the sense was that it was a process and you kind of had to pay your dues by getting rejected a lot. And I think a lot of people starting out have a really hard time with that because they're so afraid of the rejection. I think so too, and they may not want to put the time in, but I know specifically about cartoon syndication because I used to work for the Washington Post syndicate and we received uh, cartoons all the time. And if one, you know, if an editor wrote to these people, that was a major deal. But a lot, most of it, 99% of it was utter garbage. Right, of course. But even the good stuff, I would think, why do you want to be syndicated at this point when you can go out there and be read? I think a lot of people, and I've seen this with cartoonists for the New Yorker, they'll try to get in, try to get in, try to get in for five to ten years. I don't really understand that. I think there's a, at a certain point, if you're still not getting in, it may not be worth it. And you may have to find another route. Don't give up. Just find a back door. Just find another way to, to get your work across. You should have talked to me in the 80s because I did it, I think, for six or seven years before I, I got a comic published anywhere. But there was no other choices then. It no, you didn't very have limited. any other Now you can have a webcomic tomorrow. That's just it. So yeah. you can conceivably be read by as many people as who read The New Yorker. The thing is, will you be? You can put whatever you want out there. Um, I think you have to have sort of a, a balance where... At a certain point, you have to do what you want to do, how you want to do it, while also knowing you have to play the game sometimes. You do have to start off getting published and going through the hoops. And you can also do both. You can have a That's web comic right. and do your own thing and also submit. That's right. You can rec- Fire on, on every cylinder. Right. And people do. Musicians do that. They'll record an album for Warner Brothers, but then put out their own music. I think it's important to, to, ha- to make a career, but also to have um, the the creative self-worth, which is, is incredibly valuable to put what you want out there, how you want to do it. And whether it hits or not, whether it makes a lot of money, doesn't even matter, but you have what you wanted out there. It's yeah, very if, important. If you to love do doing it and you're doing it, that should be reward enough. You can work at Burger King and be happy because you're doing what you love. Right. And uh, people forget that they, they want the riches. They want the instant fame, but no one who gets into comedy for money is going to make money. Well, they're not going to last. That's another thing, right. I mean, how many years did you work at The Onion without being paid? I mean, it was a lot. The first four to five years? Nothing. I mean, there was something, but it wasn't a living wage. What did you do to make a living? I worked at a radio station, and it was a great job because I... Your uh, experience as an interview is coming out now because you're asking me questions Well, I'm just genuinely curious because... No, it's okay. We'll, We'll talk about it. I worked at a radio station that was a great job to have while trying to build a side hustle because all I had to do was push a button every hour. So every hour through that hour, I worked, I had meetings, other Onion people came to the radio station, met with me. It was great. And I always recommend people get a job like that where another good job a friend of mine had was he was a guard, a security guard at a seed company. So it was a night shift and he sat there guarding seeds. No one's breaking in. He had nothing but time. Right. He had like eight hours. And you can write a book in a month. One could. Yeah, it's important to love the comedy and do the comedy because you love it. But obviously, you got to eat. So just have a shit job that you can tolerate. Ideally, one that gives you a lot of time, doesn't sap your soul or sap that's your right. energy. Exactly. And that's what I say. I mean, keep it up. Keep doing it your whole life. It doesn't matter if you never get successful. I mean, look at you're, the poets you're doing who what you love. Worked in banks. I mean, I've worked in Vanity Fair all these years. I, mean, I think it's very important to have a two track system. You have to earn a living. Mm-hmm. Like you say, preferably with a job that doesn't kill you, that's not incredibly hard, that's not constant. You're not constantly worrying about it. I mean, the best job is that it would give you access to various people, like you had at the radio station or I have a vanity fair, but it's very important to know that you're not probably not going to make a career out of it. You're, you're going to need to do something else, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with having that two-track system where on one hand, you're earning money. On the other hand, you're doing exactly what you want because I know a lot of writers out there who are making a living doing writing, but they're miserable because they're writing for sitcoms they don't like. Yep. They're writing these quickie books they don't like. They're writing humor for various magazines that they don't like. That's not why they got into writing. They got into writing because they loved comedy and they loved laughing with their friends. They loved watching, uh, you know, Albert Brooks, Monty Python, whatever it happened to be, Mr. Show. You didn't get into it to write crappy comedy. You got into it to write good comedy. And I think that's very important. It's very true. You mentioned that you grew up in Louisiana. Well, that was later. I, I was born in Virginia and then Maryland, then New Orleans. So when did you live in New Orleans? New Orleans, it was 86 to 94. 
and you're so you're a young man, like a teenager, or right, yeah, seventeen. Did Confederacy of Dunces influence you at all? It's funny. I, I stumbled across that in the Tulane Library, the original manuscript. He went to the Tulane. original manuscript. The original, well, a copy of the original. Okay, that's fascinating. Yeah, and um, I'm fascinated by that whole saga. Well, I have to say, I I, I read the book. Um, I bought a copy and wasn't into it. And then I, I read it a few years ago, and it became my favorite book. Yeah, I think you have to be a little older to get that book. I think so. Uh, it's an astonishing book. And the backstory to me is as interesting. It's, it's a horrifying story. The, it's a story that you, let you hear about. And this is the worst-case scenario for writers. You know, incredible, a, a genius but one who was marginalized, didn't know how to get published, and only got published after death because his mom barged into Walker Percy's office in Loyola. And he killed himself, didn't he? He committed suicide. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is a tragic story, but an amazing book. And they keep trying to make a movie out of it. Well, actually, I knew someone who was about to shoot it. Uh, de- the making... It was The Will Ferrell version? Or? No, Butterflies in the typewriter. It was the biography Oh, okay. And it was the story behind it. And then they would have scenes from the book. Hmm. Uh, and John Malkovich was set to play Walker Percy. Hmm. I was going to go down there and cover it for Esquire. And then I think they lost funding. So it's one of those projects that I know that uh, a lot of people are, were obsessed with, including John Belushi, who wanted to make it. Right. Will Ferrell. It's, it's become the project. Jack Black, I heard it once. Yes. Point. But it's never been made. Yeah, and now's the time because... The book was so ahead of its time. It really was using a lot of like non sequitur, madcap type humor, and it was really dark. And that kind of humor is like the thing now. Absolutely, he was way ahead of his time. He also captured New Orleans dialect like no other. Which, I, yeah, I wasn't privy to that. It's but. very hard to do, and he did it in print. I don't know if he'd be able to do it now because some of the characters were African American. It might look be down, looked down upon. But there was a love for the characters, too. And these were characters that he knew. You know, he knew these yeah. characters really well. Uh, I was blown away by it. I couldn't believe it, uh, how good it was. And I, I'm wondering, too, why I didn't like it at the time when I was in college. But I think, as you say, it, it has to do with failed hopes and dreams and a lot of adult themes that I didn't quite grasp yet. Yeah, I think that's the thing. So I want to talk to you about your process a little bit. When you were starting, like before you had ever done anything professional before you'd ever sold anything did you write on your own and with friends and how did you build like um, a skill set in terms of producing comedy well, the skill set came from um, something I would recommend very much not doing was being very isolated and thinking that one had to be isolated as a writer I think it's the total opposite I think one should as a writer especially when you're young go out and live life and experience as much as possible I experienced not much I, I was very much a shut-in so you know, I learned how to write just by sitting in front of a computer for years upon years, but I don't think I wouldn't recommend that to anyone. I think it's the absolute wrong way. So do you think it just took you longer or you didn't learn as well as you might have? Or well, I had to teach have? myself uh, the type of writing I wanted to do. I mean, the type of writing that I would see in National Lampoon and Mad and Spy Magazine wasn't being taught. Right. The, the writers, the, teach, the teachers I had were not hustling out there trying to make a living. They were tether, uh, tenured, tethered. They were sort of tethered, too. You know, so they didn't, they didn't know what it was like to have to write for money. So they didn't teach me that. They, they taught me how to analyze an Emily Dickinson poem, how to read Walker Percy, which is all great. But did you take that in college? I did, yeah. Okay. You were like an English lit? Yeah, I was an English lit major. Okay. But I had to teach myself writing. And the only way you can really do it the technical aspect is to actually sit down and do it, but I think there's a lot more to it than, than the technical aspect, especially when it comes to comedy. You see all the early comedy writers, uh, the Earth Breckers, um, those who grew up, who literally supported their family with jokes, there was no teaching. They, they learned it all on the street, but it, it, their experiences in World War II, like Mel Brooks, their experiences in New York City or growing up in Brooklyn, or hustling that came through in their writing, and that's something that I think might be missing. You know, a comedy writer, a young comedy writer, might know every Onion headline, might know every Simpsons episode, but do they know what it's like to to watch a bar fight? Do they know what it's like to have experiences in the real world? I don't know if they do, and I kick myself for not having done that myself. I wish I had done that when I was younger. Well, let me go back to that about the the college education and like learning writing in an academic setting, because I don't have a lot of respect for that. 
And I should, I know it's not cool to say like, I don't have respect for education, but there's such a big difference between academic type writing and writing analysis and theory and whatever, and the boots on the ground, writing for money, writing to please an audience that you need to learn if you're going to actually be a professional writer. Like, how are you going to get people's attention? How are you going to wow them? That's not something that academia really talks about. And a lot of comedy people who struggle submitting articles to some of the comedy publications or whatever will often say, oh, I decided to go back to school. I'm going to go get my master's. And I knew one guy, I won't say his name, who was one of the funniest writers I, I knew, and he could crank out these brilliantly funny essays. He went to get his master's, and he was ruined. It, like, took Castrates his soul you. somehow. It I, ca- castrated him. Totally on board with you. I'm very much anti-academic. And, you know, I went to Tulane. I went to a good school. My daughter will be going to school. I don't know if I want her going to college. I'm very much against it. What I saw in college sort of ruined me. Um, well, I think you should learn history and philosophy. And you can teach that to yourself. You don't need. I mean, to go nowadays to for that. You, it's true. You don't need. To you college don't need for to that. spend eighty thousand dollars doing that. And what you say is completely correct. And I'll see this with young writers. They don't know how to write like a human being. They're writing like a tenured professor. No one wants to read that outside of college. It didn't interest me then. It doesn't interest me now. And I think it's a shame, really, because as you say, there's a lot of talent out there. And a lot of people think it has to go in a certain direction, it has to be an academic type style. That's not the case at all. No one gives a shit about that in the real world. It has world. to be fresh. It has to be honest. exciting and, and genuine, absolutely. Genuinely honest. Yeah. And there's it, it not honesty in, in that type of writing. No. It's all bullshit. I'm totally against it. And I always wonder that too. Why would someone pay money to, to learn how to, to be taught? Now, unless, it's, unless you're going to Syracuse and being taught by a genius like George Saunders, I would not go to a writing school. Uh, you, I, I would recommend going out there, living a life, and getting as much experience as possible and writing nonstop every single day. Sometimes novelists go through that system and do okay. But comedy writers, I don't know. But here's the thing, too. Example. Like, do I want to read a novel like that? Do I want to read a New Yorker short story? I do not. I'd rather... I don't either. Some people do. I don't want to do it. But I think that's a bad lesson for kids who are starting off. You can only write in the style of a New Yorker short story. No, you don't have to. If you want to write a parody of a novelization, you can do that. Yep. If you want to write for a podcast, you can do that. If you want to write for a cartoon, you can do that. It doesn't matter what you do. One is no more or less important than the next. I think there's too much emphasis placed on getting published in The New Yorker, getting published in Esquire. You know, now, more so than any time in history, that's thrown out the window. Do whatever the fuck you want, especially if it's comedy. Do whatever you want, how you want to do it. Yeah, because some of those things, you think you're getting a big break if you're in Shouts and Murmurs. And you'll get a momentary blip where a lot of people will see you, but it's not going to last. It's not going to carry you. I mean, there was that one story recently where a woman wrote an article that just went incredibly viral, and I think she took off. But that's obviously the exception. That would have gone viral if it was written for McSweeney's, though. Yeah, probably. Uh, you're absolutely right. It, people think it's going to change your life. It, it doesn't. No, because you've had Shouts and Murmurs articles published, and you're still hustling and doing your own thing. I was thrilled for it. I mean, Susan Morrison, incredible editor, incredibly nice to put me in there. I loved it. And certain people read that who wouldn't have read anything else I wrote. But you're right. It does not change your life. Right. You're going to hustle no matter what you do. And only until you write what you want to write will you be happy. It's true. So you learned how to write the wrong way, you said. What did you learn? What is your process when you take on a project, like, say, the book? What do you do first? How do you get started? How do you know to separate the wheat from the chaff? I think it all comes down... I mean, it's always just... uh, Whatever you're writing is a vehicle for the comedy. And I think... There's too much emphasis put on style. Everyone has to write like a John Updike. Everyone has to write like a Philip Roth. Well, I can't do that. I'm not that talented. I think you just have to tell the story. Just tell the story and get the jokes in there and write characters. And it doesn't really matter if it's not a gorgeous sentence, if it's not a gorgeous page of prose. It doesn't matter. But I'm talking about like how do you know, how do you write a joke? How do you come up with a character? Like do you have, do you just do it by gut instinct yeah it's just gut it's, it's never planned out i mean does it feel right to you is, is there weight to it and it used to take me a long time you know months to come back to a joke to see if it worked or not now i you, you teach yourself 
whether a joke works or not. You can sort of just tell. But another thing is, too, if you're pleasing yourself and not an editor or someone else out there, it doesn't really, you know, there's no right answer. It's not a puzzle. It, it's either right to you or it rings, it hits a melody or it doesn't. And if it doesn't, then you create another one. Yeah, and that's what gives it that feel of being a true voice and not affected by an editor or a system or anything. And it, it takes me back to Confederacy of Dunces because that's the feeling I get from that book. Absolutely. There was a guy Great writing example. in solitude who was just trying to please himself. And a lot of it, you kind of wonder, what did he mean by that? Or that's kind of weird or whatever. And then other stuff just hits you over the head like that. Oh my God, that was brilliant. And it is kind of a mixed bag, but it's so original and so fresh. That's what you're going to get with somebody who operates on that level. Right. And he paid the price for that. I mean, yeah. even, you know, Walker Percy loved it, but the editor he was dealing with, who was incredibly patient, the book editor in New York, wanted to change it, but he stuck to his guns and it never was published while he was alive. Now, if he was living now, he would put it out just the way he wanted it. But that was all about him pleasing himself as a writer, making himself laugh, not trying to please an imaginary reader or an editor or the uh, 60-year-old publisher of the company who didn't quite get it. This is someone just purely putting out work that they like. And that, that reminds me again of Mr. Show, of the, early on, of, of the Onion, of the early Simpsons, early Saturday Night Live. Um, all these shows that are done, The Office, that was done just because they found it funny. That wasn't done to have a billion dollar... Uh, following it when, when it comes to comedy it's so personal you have to find it amusing you have to find it interesting if you don't then you're lying to yourself and you're lying to the reader and but the reader will pick up on if it's something that you really rings true to you and that's really what you have to do i think as a writer otherwise why get into comedy i mean do you want to write listicles for esquire do you want to write back page pieces on trump do you want to write jokes about uh, the you know Trump's legal, I mean, I don't think most people do, I and mean, I think they get stuck in this rut. And a lot of writers that I know who are making a great living at comedy, but not writing what they want, are very frustrated. Well, on that note, thank you for inspiring us all to remember that it's about originality, and not doing it the way everyone else is doing it. And I really do it's want an to emphasize to learn. You can anyone can do it. Doesn't matter where you're from. If you're a girl sitting in in your bedroom in Ohio, you're no less important than anyone else. It used to be that way where you had to work at the Harvard Lampoon to make connections. Thank God that doesn't work that way anymore. I had a real yeah. stick up my ass for years about that. You I know, did too, because I wasn't a Harvard Lampoon. And I never, yeah, were you. never would have been. Yeah. But you don't have to do that anymore. You just have to do what you want to do, how you want to do it. Keep moving forward, have a good attitude, and just keep at it. And good things will happen. Great advice. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for listening to the How to Write Funny podcast. If you like what you hear and you hear it on iTunes, go leave us a review. It helps other people find it.